She's one of the world's premier mezzo-sopranos and has recorded over 60 albums. She's received France's highest honor for the arts and performed numerous times at the White House. Modern composers have lined up to write for her, and at a time when most classical artists think of retiring, she is still premiering new roles. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with six-time Grammy nominee, opera diva Frederica von Stada. that I've noticed in a lot of people that we've been interviewing is a big grand start in a long career. Do you find that to usually be true? A big grand start? Yeah. No, no, I don't. Really. I, I find that careers have a certain momentum and sometimes those, the big splash in the beginning is an awful lot of pressure for a new artist, a young artist. Um, and it seems like it's a big splash right in the beginning. But I think very often there's been a there's been a lot of preparation that isn't maybe as visible. So an overnight success might not quite be I overnight. Not quite <laughs> be overnight. There's you know if it's someone who's 19, they've probably been singing or dancing since they were 15 or yeah. or thinking about it. You know. Did you have parents that were pushing you in the direction to start? No, all my family were just just a tad mortified by my career. <laughs> my mother used to get so nervous about my singing that she she could barely not even come. It's hard to watch someone you love perform because you you can't separate the performer from who you know and love. And so right. I think sometimes it's hard. I had a grandmother, on the other hand, who actually sang with the Houston Grand Opera. Really? She came, we did a production of The Seagull here. It was one of the first things I did. And the wonderful composer, Thomas Possettieri, and our director said, let's have Granny be one of the walk-ons. <laughs> and she was. And opening night, my dressing room here at, at the Opera House, it was at the jo- Jones Hall then, was knee-deep in roses. And not one of them was for me. They were all for Granny. <laughs> Did so, you come out of a family that appreciated classical music, though? Not really. So my, how do you find the love? My dad did, my, but he was, he was killed in the war very early. He was a classical pianist. Um, my mom always loved it, but not in any official capacity. And it was just, I wanted to be a, a Broadway singer, so I sort of backed into opera, and I'm so grateful that I did, because it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful life. You know, to live with Mozart and Mahler and Rossini. Yeah, you talk about loving that music, and you also mm-hmm. talk about starting with the Broadway show tunes. And show stuff. tunes, yeah. It seems to me such a different discipline. How does one that has an affinity for the showstoppers move into opera? They seem so different. Well, it's a totally different use of the voice to a certain extent. To a certain extent. But a lot of the original Broadway was what they used to call legit singing. It was... Mary Morton at the beginning, um, maybe not Ethel Merman quite as much, but they sang in a very legit operatic way. And you have to remember in, in those days, in my days, <laughs> there weren't microphones. The you know Broadway theaters weren't mic'd, and so it was just the power of the voice. Right now, I'm, I just finished a tour with Samuel Ramey, and this whole second half of our program was show tunes, and we thought, oh gosh, you know, people who are classical musicians, they won't like this. People have loved it because to deliver those songs in the medium in which they were conceived, um, Jerome Kern, Richard Rogers, Cole Porter, um, Gershwin, yeah. they all loved their words. They loved their melodies, but they loved words, and they were great. It's one of our biggest legacies, the lyrics of that time. Did you ever get to do Broadway? Have you ever done the actual Broadway No, I've done stage? one show, which was here. I did a little night music. Um, no, I never, ever did. Is it anything you miss? I mean, you've played all the great stages of the world, but is there a part that says, Broadway? You know? Well, you know, I don't think I could do it. I really don't. It's such a different discipline in terms of what it requires, what it asks of you to, you know, eight shows a week, that type of thing. I'm not so sure I could do it, especially... 
Maybe not now. Although, ask me. You know, <laughs> ask me. If they I, want, you'll consider you know, it. I consider it, yeah. Take me back, though, to the beginning. 1970, I guess, was when it all started yeah, with the I, Met. Yeah, I did. Um, that. I went in, on a bet. I went into the Metropolitan Opera auditions. And I knew I had been at the Manus College of Music and did, um, you know, had just started to do opera. And I learned a couple of arias. And I went in the Metropolitan Opera auditions not expecting to win. So I had no real investment in it. I, you know, didn't have a, a incredibly high opinion of my talent. I thought, you know, I loved singing. And it wasn't totally yet where my heart was. And I kept getting called back. So then the stakes get higher. It's, yeah. you know, it's like American Idol, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got um, a, an award of money to study, and I studied, and I went back. And in the meantime, I had gotten a, received a contract. So I started my first, one of my first jobs was the Metropolitan Opera, which was, you know, pretty lucky. Yeah. People ask me, they say, what is it for a career? And I said, it's, you know, 50% talent and ability and 50% luck. Yeah. And I, I truly believe it. I, when I was first at the Met, I had the most amazing manager, Matthew Epstein, who I've really reconnected with lately and has, has been one of the great managers of all time because of his incredible devotion to music. And he was my first manager, and then the first pianist I worked with was one of the great musicians of all time, Martin Katz. And so I just had these incredible guardian angels and was sort of propelled along without much conscience. As you become more popular, as your reputation grows, do you find that auditioning became harder in some way? Was there an expectation now? As you're talking about, you start out, nobody quite knows mm -hmm. who you are, yeah. and... But as people now are saying, hey, that's the one we've heard about. For you as a performer, do you sense that? Oh, I think so. I think, you know, the one of, it's, it's interesting to speak to some of my younger colleagues now who are superstars. And there's a terrific period when you're the newcomer that it's very exciting and everything is new. And um, the expectations are high, but there's also some understanding that there's a way, ways to go. And that's a wonderful time. The hard period is when you are not the newcomer. Mm -hmm. And then as much as you are sort of built up, then there starts to be lots wrong with you. And it's possible that, I mean, it's, it's likely that it's true, too. You're in your learning period and you're right. fitting things on. And then you go through a nice grace period, which I'm in now, which is veteran, you know. So <laughs> what do we expect? You know, she's old. She's been around. This is, um, this is what strikes me very funny about you, is that I read all these things where you talk about, you know, you're older now, you're, you're taking it easy and all this stuff. You're still premiering new roles. You're doing things that people in the beginning of their career are doing. Why do you still do that? You could coast on a lot of roles that you've done in the past. No, it's, I, I, the, the roles that I did mainly were 15-year-olds, and well, yeah. trust me, I can't do that anymore. Um, I've just been so lucky. I really have. Um, I've had my guardian angels of, of Matthew and a young, wonderful young manager that I have now and great musicians around me, and um, I think a lot of it is just really Jake Heggie, who I know you've had on your program, is, it feels almost like a son to me. I, yeah. I adore him, and he's believed in me and written music for me and I've premiered some of his things. It's, it's been a terrific good fortune and one of the things I am thinking about and have, have been thinking of with the help of this great friend Matthew is how to leave the business and I really want to leave it in a kind of doing benefits for some of the companies that have been really good to me like this company in their honor as a kind of thank you you know, thank you for what I've had. I never yeah. expected to have. Is this there kind a of point, career. though, an age, a moment, as a opera singer that you have to say, "Okay, enough," or can you continue the career? Is I think you can continue to a certain point. The boys can go on a lot longer, it seems, because I think women play, you know, young ingenue roles, or they move into the mother and witches roles, <laughs> the character roles. roles, character roles, and <laughs> if you want to do that. You know, um, I'm I'm beginning to see that I think it is a little bit of a young people's sport, and I I love it. 
with all my heart. I love hearing the young voices. I love the camaraderie. I love the preparation. I love the stagehands. I love the orchestra backstage, everything. But I, there's, there's a moment when you start feeling like you're dressed in your daughter's prom dress, you know, that <laughs> you are a little too old to have a bow across, right. you know, the back of your <laughs> waist. Um, and that's how I feel. Now, many of my colleagues have gone on enormously successfully, you know, you know, practically till 70. I, I don't think I will. I, I know I'll... Um, got a couple more years and I'm having great fun doing these I call them my senior PGA tours <laughs> um, <laughs> and they're fun because we do have something to do and I love concerts um, but I I feel that you know that the time has come the walrus said and yeah. it's soon it's soon I read a quote where you were quoting someone else actually Marilyn Horn talking about what singing means to the person as opposed to it being their life or making their life. How do you see yourself as a performer, as a singer? How, how much of your life does that take up? It takes up a lot, but it, it really got pushed into a, a back seat when I had my children. And it, it is there. You know, once you have children and have family, um, there is just, for me, there's nothing more. And it's, it's become a way to take care of my children as well. Um, and I still have this blind passion for singing and performing that I've always had. Uh, but I, I've always had a pull back to it. And I've been lucky that I've been able to be with my kids and be around my family. But even now, being away is, is hard. We yeah. haven't I have a new little bonus granddaughter at home. <laughs> My daughters are doing exciting things. And, and that's the pull, is when... My very own daughters have their babies. Oh, my goodness. You know, <laughs> they will you know, have to lock their doors. Um, and and I, I, I feel blessed in that. Were you always this balanced? Were you always this understanding of career as career and family as family? Or was there a time you made sacrifices or made... Oh, I think, that you oh think. my gosh, it's always, it's always, um, it's never in balance. I'm totally not balanced at all. <laughs> and it never is. I mean, it's always the, the pull for a performer who has children. You know, it's interesting. There was a wonderful old doctor in England um, whose name I can't remember now, but he analyzed the connection between a singer and their voice not especially opera singers, but any singer in their voice. And the only connection, human connection, greater than a performer and their voice, their instrument, is that of mother and child. Really? You know, it's that. It is. I mean, I have friends who have woken up from operations not knowing what was removed. And, you know, in the, op- in the recovery room, they're going, ah, mm, yeah, ah. is the voice still there? Is it okay? Yeah. It's that great a connection and it's it's sort of you have to forgive it but you have to kind of delight in it too that yeah. you know we've been and, and many of us have been given a great voice many more actually today than people know because there's not enough singing in schools and not enough singing in all of our lives so that people can really enjoy it can you be taught to be a great singer or is it a gift i think the instrument is a gift i think the ear is a gift but you can, you can teach a lot. And one of the interesting difficulties of our profession, especially singers, is that if you have a good voice and a good ear and you've never sung a note of music, in a month you could be taught to sing an aria. That couldn't happen with a, with a pianist or a violinist because they're dependent on muscle memory. And if you haven't trained as a pianist or a violinist or a dancer... From an early age, there's just so much you can accomplish at a, at, after a certain point. But a singer can do it. So that um, with a certain amount of basic talent, they yeah. can... I did it. I didn't had never heard of Mozart or Amboise Thomas, and I learned an aria in a couple of weeks and sang it for an audition and you know, got into a music school. I had not heard of Mahler. I had not heard of Berlioz or any of those composers. 
The only opera I heard was on the radio when my mom played it. And, you know, I, it's, the difficulty is, is then training yourself to take the baby steps you need to take right. to actually develop your voice. I heard a rumor you still take voice lessons. Is that oh, true? Oh, yes. And there's, really? There's meant to be a, you know, I work with a wonderful lady in, in Oakland who I adore, who has such a pure spirit. I gave myself to 60 to figure out you what know, you exactly want to do with your what life? I wanted with my voice, but <laughs> I've had to extend that a few years. <laughs> so, what is it exactly you wanted to do with your voice? Well, I think to to really use my instrument the way instrumentalists do. I would love to. Um, I I have not been able to, and I I think I came closer than I gave myself credit for when I was younger. And now, with with some seniority, you have to think a little bit more about production and I'm always learning things always yeah. and you do learn because the instrument is growing up mm-hmm. or growing older with your body so it, it always needs readjustment yeah. are there performances you look back on and remember as and you might even have but wish that there were recordings of it moments where you thought all the elements just came together perfectly N- no I'm far really? too critical I think that um Listening to your voice and and observing your performance is one of the most dangerous things that you can do as a performer because it means that you are sort of monitoring it as you're presenting it. And that takes a certain amount of concentration. And I've had the happiest times when I have not monitored it and have been able to totally concentrate on what I'm doing now. That's the ideal. You know, one doesn't come that close right. because I don't know, one day I was doing a performance and this man keeled over in the middle of it and he had had a heart attack. In well, the audience? In the audience. And he was all right. I'm oh, happy okay. to say. <laughs> you didn't kill but him. But of course, you know, you think, what did I, What was I doing? What did I sing? What did I do? <laughs> what, you hated the music? or, um, You know, there are things going on around you and you're aware of them and you see, we face the public totally and you know, you see people nodding off or looking bored or... Yeah. Um, so that you are aware of that. But the more concentrated you are on what you're supposed to do, the happier you are. Really? Do you sing for yourself or is it for oh, the audience? All day long I sing. I love to sing. And sing I on the treadmill in the morning, I Sing heard? on the treadmill. In fact, I was at the treadmill where I'm staying here and the ladies from... You know, when the offices nearby came and closed all the doors, so <laughs> I, got, I got a pretty bad review there. Yeah, that wasn't a good one. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't so good. A yeah. few years back, I'm assuming at some point you were sitting at your home and either the phone rang or you turned on the TV and you saw yourself being referred to on the series Northern Exposure. <laughs> when a moment like that happens, does that is that like a wake-up call that, wait a minute, I'm in the, the world of pop culture now. I'm a name <laughs> that people are recognizing. Oh, it's, you know, in our business, we, we have some lovely exposures, but they're not of the nature that someone like Madonna is. You know, um, right. I was lucky enough to do the Emmys this year. I sang the da-da-da-da-da-da-da with, um, you know, for uh, Star Trek and... Oh, I had the time of my life, you know, and <laughs> television people yeah. like, are so nice to us, you know. Because um, <laughs> we know you have the real talent. <laughs> no, it's because we do something different and we are totally in awe of what you do. So there's, you start from this place of sort of mutual admiration and respect. And it was just, it was like being, you know, a TV star for so the day. So people don't know and, what I'm talking about. Those yeah. back on Northern Exposure, yeah. there was a character obsessed with you, the performer. <laughs> and it was worked in. And I know that in the opera world, you have a name and a reputation. But to cross over into something so pop culture is really kind of, I think, a kick for oh, it's a kick. business. Oh, it's a total kick. And then sometimes if people recognize you, it's, it's a big kick too, you know. Opening the, uh, the Olympics. How about that? That was fun. Because, I mean, that's, you can't help be part of the Olympics and not feel this kind of national pride. pride. Yeah. And I mean, every time I sing in Washington, I just, I keep practically saluting buildings because I love Washington <laughs> so much. And it means I grew up in Washington and it means a lot to me, you know, the nation's capital. And yeah. it's great. It makes me proud. So being part of the Olympics was a big thrill.
preparing for the Olympics, in, in my mind, that seems so massive and so much is going on that you'd kind of get lost in the shuffle of everything. Do they take care of you at something? Or is it, get out there, sing, you're going to be on at this moment. Oh, no, they take terrific care, Do they? really. And everything I've done that's for television, it's been, oh, yes, now come over here, and it's two steps, and watch that. And, you know, and people... So I had this last time, I had my makeup sort of spray painted on. It was fantastic. It was <laughs> like this airbrush. Um, they took away all this. Um, it was, I had a ball. Yeah. No, they're just adorable, really wonderful, wonderful. I've always had a great experience doing television. I don't know if I ever did a, my great, great regret, I have to say, is never doing a Muppet show. You know, really? I would have loved to do the Muppets. <laughs> I love the Muppets. Well, maybe there's still a Sesame Street for Sesame, you there. Maybe, you know? maybe, yeah. <laughs> performing at the White House, does that change than performing at any theater? Do you feel the sense of difference? Oh, totally. Why totally. Is it's because you're singing for the president of your, com- your country, and I've, I've sung for a number of presidents, and I've been to the White House several times, and, oh, I just walk in the door, and I'm... I'm thrilled and excited. I sang a lot for um, President and Mrs. Reagan, and they were just adorable. She was just so sweet to us always. Yeah. Um, and I, it just, and and for President Bush, I just loved it. And I felt the same thing. You're walking through the White House. Um, with heads of state and, you know, and, and they're live and they're sitting there. They're not the best public <laughs> yeah. because they're exhausted, you know. They're running countries. Um, yeah. And you're just sitting there sort of, oh, singing a little tune. Um, but, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm just bursting with pride when I'm there. There are people who I think seem to forget the fact and get caught up in the politics of it all and forget the pageantry of it, the, the importance of yes. performing for the head of state as opposed to the political debate going yeah, on. Yeah, no, we're not, you know, opera singers are rarely politicians. And, and I think that we always, you sing for your country and it's whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. And, um, and it means a lot. It means a lot. It's, uh, we have, we're lucky to have the White House. We're lucky to have Washington. We're lucky to have, um, the interest in it, you know, and there's yeah. lots. Be- I'm about to sing for um, Memorial Day. I'm so excited, you know, and I had had not been to the Capitol in years. I did a benefit for Kennedy Center, and you know, go into the Senate and sit down at <laughs> Senator Kennedy's desk and go through what you know, see where he sits and thinks. Yeah. It it is. It it can't help but mean a lot. Do you still get, I, I'm assuming you, you get excited with all these things. Is there a part of you that's jaded at all to the public world? Or is it still a fascination? No, it's still a fascination. I don't, I don't feel jaded. I love meeting people and you meet people in all, from all different backgrounds in, in, in my business. And it's always interesting. You know, people who have had different lives. And one of the big things that, that impressed me deeply lately was I did a benefit in New Orleans. And I, I asked a cab driver to take me to the Ninth Ward, and I was just horrified. You yeah. know? And this was a man who is a bank manager and was on partial payroll, um, but just couldn't stand not doing anything for nine months. So he took a job as a cab driver, and, um, you know, it was... It's, and I love New Orleans, and I've sung there many times. And to see that country, to see that city, it in so compromised is, you know, was yeah. disheartening. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. And being that we come out of Houston too, the the well, influx Houston that has felt done a lot. Yeah. Houston has really set a very good example of what can be done to help people. You know, changing gears real quick before we run out of time, yeah. music education for children. Mm, my favorite subject. Um, I'm happy we got to it. Yes, <laughs> I am so pro anything that can be done. And it's, I'm in, I live in California, and I, I've done a lot to try and help. We do, uh, there's something called the Alameda Education Foundation, which is local for me, and we put on benefits every year to raise extra money. It's so important. And I'm thinking of something which I'm going to misquote, but your beautiful Manil. Um, collection. collection here. There's something that 
um, it's related to what Mrs. Manila said, but it's, you know, um, it is through art that you get to truth um, and bring it to the people. And that, how important is that? And not every child is a scientist or a mathematician. There's right, I mean, I'm not, and I had a, a great life in music. And that whole creative spirit, we need it more than ever. I work with um, kids in, in where I live in Oakland, and I do teach singing to f five and six-year-olds. And we put on little plays for their parents in this daycare center. And the discoveries I've made of in working with these kids are just extraordinary. And I feel every musician who's out there needs to turn a great deal of their energy at some point in their career toward music education. I admire um, Yo-Yo Mavril. He's done many, and it's, it doesn't take that much. Just, yeah. you know, an appearance here, funding, an awareness. It's, it's so important for what's going to happen to, to us as a nation if we don't, not just music education, but education. Right. It's everything. It can change the course of, you know, human nature education, I think. Well, I'm going to tell you, we are exactly out of time at this moment. I'm going to thank you for your appearance here. Thank you. Federica von Stade. Thank you. Order a transcript, call 866 652 3378 or send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Mm -hmm.